Dr. Brewer, thank you very much for joining us today. Now this has had quite a few conversations revolving around mental health. And I think when we're looking at this pandemic, it's definitely the number one topic on everybody's mind from anxiety and depression and isolation. All of these things are affecting us one way or another. So what have you seen since we've been in this lockdown situation for the last couple of months? I've certainly seen an increase in anxiety uh, to the point where sometimes it progresses to panic. And I think in general, folks are you know, they're trying to do the best they can uh, while sheltering in place, but that's not easy. You know, I think of it as, you know, my patients with anxiety have anxiety levels that are a certain level, and then, you know, something can push them over the edge where they go to panic or use substances or things like that. I think the baseline level of the entire population has gone up a bit, <laughs> you know, in terms of, of the overall anxiety And is level. this something that we should expect to be normal under these circumstances? I mean, I know all of this is unprecedented and not normal, uh, but it, I know it can be easy to feel some sort of shame or, or guilt with these feelings in lockdown. Yeah, I think that can be uh, that can be the case where folks can feel shame or guilt. It's, it's normal. These are our brains trying to help us survive. You know, fear is a, a survival mechanism. It helps us learn to avoid where danger is. Uh, but the problem is that fear when coupled with uncertainty, uh, it can lead to anxiety. And so this is where, you know, this is just our survival brain trying to help us survive, but the amount of uncertainty, uncertainty that we have is pretty unprecedented. And so I think those that combination leads to anxiety, and then you pair anxiety with things like social contagion, which is just the spread of affect or emotion from one person to another. You add that on top of the anxiety, we can get panic. So this is where we've seen panic buying and things like that. So I, and we've also seen, you know, people feel guilty because they're not doing more. They feel ashamed that they, you know, that they can't do this or that. And those can even spiral out of control in, in certain, even habitual ways. So, you know, I think the thing I would say here is for all of us to just recognize this is our, just our survival brain trying to help us out. You know, we've got these unusual circumstances that are leading to increased anxiety, even some panic. But it, we, it's helpful not to add to that by feeling bad or feeling guilty about ourselves. Um, and that guilt and shame is, you know, just our brain kind of being slightly out of um, trying to do its best, but kind of being slightly off target um, in, in how it works. And you made a great point about things being unknown. There are just answers we don't have and can't force anybody to give us right now. Um, how do you deal with that? How do you let your brain kind of cope with this idea of the unknown and being okay with it being unknown? Or will we ever be able to be okay with the unknown? I think we can. I absolutely think we can. And my labs even researched some of this. But here I would say the first step is just understanding how this process works. You know, even, and I've put out some YouTube videos and some short animations on my website to help people just understand this process. It's actually relatively simple. You know, three-step process to form, to learn anything, you know, trigger a behavior and a, and a reward. So just helping um, people understand that's a really good step forward. It can help people kind of illuminate their minds so that they're not just working with their brain being a black box and kind of pushing them around. So that's something that anybody can do is just kind of learn and map out some of their, you know, their habitual reactions to, to uncertainty, you know? So let's say there's uncertainty, that's the trigger. The behavior might be going and looking, you know, checking our newsfeed every five minutes, you know? And then the re reward is occasionally we'll learn something new. Well, interestingly, uh, and I actually did a YouTube video on this, uh, if we're looking at the news, looking at the news, looking at the news, and we don't know when a big story is going to hit, that's just like pulling the lever on a slot machine. You know, you don't know when you're going to hit the jackpot. We can learn to get addicted to the news in the same way that we can learn to get addicted to at any casino. And so they are just understanding that process and seeing, oh, this is my brain, you know, in survival mode. But based on the circumstances, I'm more likely to get, you know, hooked on my news feed. That's the first step. The second step is being able to substitute what I think of as the BBO, the bigger, better offer. Um, so if we can start to see how uncomfortable uncertainty feels, it's already not very rewarding. 
And when we go and check the news feeds, that's not that rewarding. You know, it's like, okay, we check the news, we learn something great. And then we, you know, we find ourselves uh, jonesing for the news again, you know, an hour later or whatever. So it doesn't actually satisfy that. Instead, we can actually turn toward that uncertainty itself and bring curiosity. And I think of curiosity as a superpower. You know, if we can learn to get curious, uh, we can learn to be with uncertainty and be with those urges to act without acting on them. My lab's even done studies with app-based mindfulness training programs where we've shown that we can get a 40% reduction in craving-related eating when people have this urge to eat out of emotional um, steps or even uh, unwind anxiety with app-based mindfulness training where we're getting a 63% reduction in clinically validated anxiety scores. All of this from helping people understand how their minds work and learn to develop mindfulness skills around being curious, for example. Well, there's a bit of irony in talking about uh, in digesting the news that's coming out and keeping in touch with organizations, considering I, I work for one and I'm in it every day, but there, do you believe that there's a certain benefit that might become from being in the know and understanding what's going on and without getting lost in misinformation, there has to be some sort of sweet balance where you know you're going to reliable places that might in some way alleviate any of those concerns that you have if you know you're going to a place where you're gonna get the most you know, solid, valuable, valid information. Yeah, I think you're pointing out something really important, which is you know, if we tend to go on news sites or social media where um, you know there are a lot of things being passed around that are fear-based or speculation-based or even conspiracy-based, those things those trigger our survival parts of the brain. You know, fear makes our thinking brain go offline, so we can't actually determine what's accurate information. So that actually makes things worse. It's like somebody sneezing on our brain. You know, that's what social contagion is. You know, six feet isn't going to protect you from that. <laughs> you know, wearing a mask isn't going to protect you from that. So here, you know, we can look to see what news sources am I pulled toward and what's it feel like when I go on social media? Do I actually feel relieved or do I feel more anxious or more worried or more panicked? And then what happens when I compare that to a reliable news source or the WHO or the CDC or something like that, you know, and get accurate information? Does that satisfy me longer? The other thing we can do is check to see why am I going on the news? You know, when did I check last time? You know, if I checked an hour ago, the likelihood that a breaking story is going to have happened is pretty low. So we can learn to even titrate checking the news. What's it feel like to check the news once or twice a day and then stop at that and then free, free up all that space to do more productive things than, you know, get lost in the newsreel? Well, we have the relationship with news and with media, then we have a relationship with people, with our friends, with our family, everyone we're connecting with digitally. At what point do we recognize that maybe a helpful way to cope with our anxiety or our mental health is to reach out to others and talk it out? And at what point does it become too much an oversaturation of reaching out to other people? Well, this is where it's similar to news. So it depends on what we're reaching out for and to whom we're reaching out. So here, you know, it's like uh, eating. You know, for example, if we eat because we're stressed out, we're not actually fixing the root cause of the stress. We're just temporarily making ourselves feel better. In the same way, if we're reaching out because we want to feel connected and we're going on social media to feel connected, it's not actually that great for connecting us. If we can recognize what that need is, then we can say, oh, well, maybe I could spend time, you know, finding that connection in a way that's truly connecting. And so we can actually meet those needs without uh, feeding other habits or even addictions. What is your advice to somebody who might not be used to experiencing high levels of anxiety and is just now starting to feel those those emotions or even the physical aspects of it? What what parts do they recognize? How do you know that you have it in the first place and how can you gauge how severe it is? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's pretty individual. So here, I would say the studies show that in general, people feel anxiety as kind of a closed down or contracted, you know, feeling, which is actually evolutionarily, you know, makes sense. You know, if we're being chased by the cyber tooth tiger, our job is to make ourselves the smallest target as possible, right? So we can, we can check in with ourselves. Does it feel contracted? Does it feel restless? People tend to feel it more in their, you know, in their abdomen and in their chest than say in their feet. 
and we can just check in, you know, is there a restless quality? Is there, you know, is there a feeling of nervousness? Am I projecting into the future? Anxiety typically relates to, you know, worry about something that's uncertain or something that's going to happen into the future. Um, so we can look for those telltale signs. And then I would say severity is really, really individual. You know, it's hard to say, you know, oh, you have really severe anxiety. You don't. This is all based on our own internal experience. From an individual standpoint, you know, we can check in with ourselves to see, you know, is this a 10 out of, is this the worst anxiety I've ever had? You know, is this moderate? And so we can, we can check relative to what we felt in the past. Surprisingly, I've, I've had this question quite a few times already of mistaking symptoms of anxiety for symptoms of coronavirus, which can be shortness of breath, you know, this, the cough, the something that can just make your body feel overwhelmed. And if you start overthinking it, then you start to think it's true. So at what point do you have any good advice for how to take a step back, really evaluate it, not mix up other things and go to extreme thoughts if you know it's likely that you, you aren't infected? Yeah, there are two things that I would recommend. So one of the standard mindfulness practices is bringing awareness to one's breath. But like you're pointing out, you know, with both with anxiety and coronavirus, uh, the chest tends to be a place that's anxiety provoking. So here I would recommend that people uh, ground themselves in their present moment experience, not in the chest area. So I like the feet as an anxiety free zone. And uh, they t <laughs> our feet tend not to be the first sign of, of having coronavirus, from what I understand. So we can simply, you know, feel into our feet, we can wiggle our toes, we can just get really curious and, and ask questions like, hmm, which foot feels warmer than the other foot? You know, as a way to awaken our natural curiosity. So that's a great way to kind of literally ground ourselves, um, calm ourselves down so that we can actually bring our thinking brains back online. Another practice that I love, and I, I did the, a YouTube video on this, is called the uh, five finger breathing practice, where we simply, you know, take a hand. As we breathe in, we trace up the outside of our pinky. As we breathe out, we trace down the inside, you know, trace up um, as we breathe in, trace down. And so you can you can trace your entire hand, you know, as a way to count five breaths, which actually brings together not only seeing, but feeling both hands and also feeling our breath, which is a great way to really ground us in the present moment in a complete way, which makes it harder for that anxiety to really come in and take control over us. I really like that example. That's a great one that I haven't heard before. And I think not only could be useful for me and for other adults, but even for children, that seems like a good exercise to keep to keep kids focused and calm and, and kind of gear their attention towards, towards a new exercise. Yeah, and I like it in particular, I'm glad you bring up children, because children want to help. And when they notice that their parents are anxious, you know, if a parent is anxious, it's harder for them to kind of calm down themselves. So they can teach this to their kids and they can say, hey, if I look anxious, why don't you come up to me and lead me through a five finger breathing practice? So the kid feels like they're helping, they feel like in, they're in control, and they can even help a parent take a breath, take a beat, you know, and, and calm down. Great to do before meals at transition points during the day, you know, before a nap, before bedtime, many, many places and ways that, that families can do this together. And, you know, while we're talking about children, I realize how difficult this must be for people to explain to somebody who doesn't understand the branches of government, and understand all of the health codes and understand all of these things that we're doing in society to keep everything as confined as possible. How do we explain to you know a five-year-old why they can't go into grandma's house and they can only touch through glass? I can only imagine how strange and confusing that is. That's a great question. I'm not sure I'll be the best person to answer that. But here I would say I, I love the use of you know simplicity and analogy. So here, you know, if there are concepts that that our kids do understand, you know, and there's one that's related in terms of you know, visiting a, a relative or something like that, using those uh, already known concepts as a way to, to help bridge that gap in understanding. Um, you know, Cause you know, viruses are microscopic and it might be difficult to understand you know, that somebody can get sick from something that they don't see. 
Um, but in many ways, I think children are a lot smarter than we often give them credit for. <laughs> and they understand a lot more than we might think. In terms of, you know, our primary audience is millennials and, and young adults who now have resorted to working from home. And I've seen a lot of people, you know, dealing with the daily stress, waking up for your morning meetings, hitting your deadlines, giving all of your deliverables. Um, but those moments of your, the stressful moments, part of your day that, you know, you were used to in the office, now you're handling alone, maybe without a roommate or already in a tense situation, maybe a couple of weeks too long with, with your family. How do you prevent regular daily stress you used to have and used to face from feeling 10 times more intense now at home, isolated or more confined rather than an office environment? For any of us working from home, and I'm this is the case for me as well, we now might have a little bit of extra time where we're not commuting. We're not spending that time commuting to work. We can take that time uh, to commute <laughs> with ourselves or commune you know, with ourselves or with nature. So we can take that time to exercise, to make sure that we're you know, eating healthy food, to take a moment to, or a few minutes to meditate or to pray or to do yoga. I think these are great ways to help us kind of keep our baseline level of anxiety lower so that when those inevitable, oh crap moments come up, we're less likely to go over the edge. Maybe I should relabel my kitchen, the cafe, and the living room, the gym, so I feel like I'm in a different setting that I'm escaping to. I love it, I love it, I love it. <laughs> what do you think are going to be the long-term effects of this? This is something unprecedented for a lot of us, um, but in a way, you know, we're seeing a lot of pictures of history kind of repeating itself with other generations who dealt with this. What have we learned from those moments and how it's affected us um, in, our, in our mindset psychologically after the fact, when we start adjusting back to normal life? Or, you know, if we're not able to find normal again and we have a new normal? I don't really know, but what I would like to hope, so I'm going to put this out there as what I would like to hope, is that we've all realized that um, you know uh, hyperpartisan and, and tribalism and you know sexism and racism and all this stuff that we've been stuck in for so long, it, we just don't have time or energy for that. I've seen a lot of people coming together, crossing boundaries that have been you know artificially uh, started, you know, or, or developed, you know, bo you know borders and walls being built over the last decades, which have large, uh, many times come down. And I, I would really hope that people see really, really clearly how much better it feels, how much more rewarding it is for all of us to work together toward a common goal, which is around our own, everybody's health and happiness. And I would hope that we move far enough down that spectrum to see how much, so much better that is than, you know, being against each other that we would all uh, shift and not be able to go back to our old ways in, in that respect. So that's one thing that I would, I would really hope for all of us. Another pragmatic thing is I think we're learning a lot of things scientifically about pandemics in the modern day where we've got modern technology that we didn't have in 1918. So I would hope this would also help us prepare uh, physically for you know future uh, future outbreaks, um, such that they are not as as severe as this one was. So my hope is that mentally we shift and we can never shift back. Um, what I think we're seeing pragmatically is that physically, you know, we're, we're learning a ton uh, from this, and uh, I don't think you know we will be we caught in the same situation in the future. And so when that day does come where hopefully we're all back in the office or back to our regular day-to-day -day schedule, what are some helpful things maybe managers or supervisors can do to be mindful of getting back to adjusting? And I mean, of course, they'll be adjusting themselves, but really being a good support system for a team and for a group of people who are all coming back a little bit more you know, scattered and, and kind of readjusting putting themselves in their coworkers or their supervisees shoes is really, really important. You know, um, developing the empathy and compassion around, you know, people coming in that, who might be struggling more than they had in the past, uh, who might have more financial struggles or they might have more anxiety or whatever, 
being able to uh, relate to them rather than react and say, you know, snap out of it um, is going to be really important for all of us, you know, to to just bring some kindness, to bring some connection and also hopefully um, bring some humanity uh, or bring more humanity. I'm sure there are many workplaces that have this as a priority, but I would love to see that, um, you know, workplace priorities include more you know, humanistic aspects where they, they realize they can actually get a double bottom line where, you know, <laughs> kindness in the workplace actually helps people be more productive um, rather than, you know, what, what's the saying, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves, you know, you know, that tends to be this, this very um, short sighted, you know, goal oriented thing that just burns people out. I would love to see uh, that change as well. And I think that's all that's up to the managers, that's up to the coworkers, that's up to all of us to really, you know, check to see what what is the better way to move forward and see this as a reset button instead of just going back to our old ways of being. Yeah, you know, a friend of mine gave me a good reminder that during these times where everything just feels a little extra stressful, just to give yourself some grace and to give others, you know, grace and mindfulness and kindness is really what all of us need right now. Absolutely. So once we have discovered we have anxiety or we're feeling all these things, I think another feeling that comes up is guilt. You know, we're seeing, especially me, reporting on stories of nurses and doctors and people out on the front lines at our grocery stores and delivery men, men and women. There's, it's easy to just feel guilty that they're out there and we're at home. How do we manage that guilt and help the greater good to, to alleviate any of that or to even help them uh, while we're at home? I'm glad you bring that up because I'm seeing a lot of that as well. I think the first step is just mapping out guilt as a, as a maladaptive habit loop. You know, So we see somebody else doing good deeds. That's the trigger. We feel guilty. That's the behavior. And then the result of that is that we feel shame, like, oh, I'm a bad person. And then that spirals out into a shame, you know, more and more shame into a shame spiral. So here, just recognizing that that's our survival brain trying to help us out that's a little askew is a way to first step out of it. The next step there is to notice what it feels like. What does shame feel like compared to being kind to ourselves? So bring in a little bit of self-compassion, a little bit of self-kindness, and then just compare the two. Our brains are always looking for that bigger, better offer, that BBO. And if we can see very clearly, you know, a few moments of kindness versus a few moments of shame, you know, kindness feels so much better to our brains. It's a no brainer. And so here it's just a matter of taking a few moments to step back, map it out and notice, oh, you know, when I kind of myself, it feels better. Rinse and repeat. Absolutely. I love that. I, I just think we need to say, I feel like the more we say kindness and put it out there, the more maybe it'll get into everyone's energy. So I, I definitely agree with that. And lastly, to, just to wrap up our conversation, what are tools that people can use? Um, you know, also understanding some might not have the resources for expensive therapy or someone to talk to, or, or, you know, even online resources that might come with a big price tag. What are some helpful tools and resources to use at home to cope with all of this? When it comes to anxiety, I just was on the Dr. Oz show, and I think he's giving out a free um, month free of our Unwinding Anxiety app. So in terms of folks you know, needing something that's free, we have this clinically validated app that can help people with anxiety, You know, um, evidence-based. We've got two clinical studies under the belt now, and um, you know, Dr. Oz is giving out for free. So um, there are there are resources like this. Um, I've got a bunch of resources on my website uh, that people, you know, guided meditations, things like that. So I would say finding good evidence-based um, free resources. There are a lot of them out there, um, and certainly, you know, my my website's one of them. There are many others as well, um, but folks can certainly uh, avail themselves of those. Well, Dr. Brewer, thank you very much for taking time to chat with us today. Of course, this is something that we care about and want to share with our audience, and mental health is definitely a top priority for all of us. So thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure.